Hello, I am Robert Mason and I teach the archaeology of stuff. This is not actually me you're looking at, it is my avatar who will be appear periodically to provide moral support. This is the first of the 40 or so video lectures that comprise this course. Each should be about 25 minutes. These will be outlined a bit later in this lecture. I intend to release for a week which will remain available for the duration of the course. Before we get any further, I would like to say that many lectures will contain human remains. There will be a little notice at the beginning of the lecture, so if they disturb you, you should be prepared to be disturbed. So firstly, what is the archaeology of stuff? Firstly, it is archaeology, a term that derives from two ancient Greek words that basically means the study of the past but it implicitly refers to the human past, not dinosaurs. It can involve any part of the world of humans of the past, but there is no archaeology of the past before humans. However, it is not history, which is a study based on texts. It may get messy when archaeologists develop culture histories and historians do archaeology, but these are fundamentally different disciplines more or less. Archaeologists get their information from many sources, but the primary method is digging things up. That said, there are a lot of texts written in the past that tell us a lot about how objects are made and used. That brings us to what is stuff. The origins of the term may be related to our concept of stuffing, but by the medieval period it also certainly came to mean objects, the stuff that we have in our possession, perhaps originally stuffed into our baggage. However, we try not to use the term things. Things have all sorts of meanings and ramifications that we really do not want to get into. In disciplines, we are trying to avoid no matter how unsuccessfully. Other disciplines that we may be trying to avoid include physics, geology, chemistry and biology. So there may be times when you feel inundated by information for this. So in these cases I have provided sage advice and the green arrow. This points to any information you really need to take note of. Everything else is just background. So the archaeology of stuff is about the people of the past acquiring stuff, often called raw materials, perhaps by cutting it down or digging it up. For some materials, extensive preparation may be required. For example, harvesting materials from domesticated species will first require domesticating the species. Another example is coppicing or polluting trees to produce an abundance of straight poles all this needs to be done before actually acquiring raw materials. Collectively, this may be termed raw material procurement. These are important concepts I should take a note of. This raw material will often then need to be processed. For instance, these are clay settling pans used to process a raw geological deposit into something you can successfully make pottery with. Sometimes this requires some form of technology. Only then can you make stuff, which will certainly require technology of some sort. Then the people of the past will have used these objects. Sometimes there is confusion between how an object was intended to be used, its intended function, and how it was actually used. Sometimes there may be modification of an object for reuse. The next thing that humans do with their stuff is to discard. This may be done deliberately, depositing into a grave or a cache, or it may be thrown away or accidentally lost. For instance, this gentleman accidentally lost his equipment when a volcano killed him and covered him with ash. 
For some technologies, discarded objects are recycled and so become raw materials themselves. This sequence of processes of initial raw material procurement, raw material processing, object manufacture, the life of the object itself and its eventual loss from use to be committed to the archaeological record is sometimes referred to as a chain operatoire or chain of operations. The chain operatoire is nothing to get hung up on. Just remember there is a sequence of processes which may or may not be sequential. With these take an object from an idea and its maker's head to an object that may be subjected to study by us. An important aspect of this course it is based in the Middle East. For our purposes, the Middle East starts at the Straits of Gibraltar and North Africa. It includes Egypt, the land of the Nile. It includes the Levant, or Greater Syria, and also Anatolia. It includes Iraq, or Mesopotamia, home of the Trigus and the Euphrates rivers. Arabia, birthplace of Islam. Iran, the home of Persian culture. And also Central Asia. But stuff came to the Middle East from China, especially porcelain. From South Asia came steel and other technologies. From Africa came humanity itself. While from Europe came a whole lot of trouble. But as this is a one world archaeology, we will at times touch on stuff from the Pacific and the Americas. Although the focus is the Middle East. For example, this interesting find in the Yukon provides information about how objects were made in the past that we may not have from elsewhere, from the binding of the point to the fletching. The next lecture will outline the nature of our methods of study of stuff, one of which of course is excavation. This is me, by the way, the one on the right, working in Syria in 2002. We will then cover the physical geography of the Middle East. How it came to look the way it did and how that explains the distribution of stuff. This is followed by the climate of the Middle East. Essentially, why are the green bits green and how does that impact the distribution of stuff? The course will then go on to look at the very matter of stuff, the structure of the materials from which stuff is made. This should not be challenging as it, basically, it has is basically grade 8 material, but it is important to understand the nature of stuff. Then we cover minerals, the most primal of stuff. Oddly enough, some understanding of minerals augments the understanding of materials like pottery and metals, as you will be finding out later on. We then have a case study of a type of objects, seals, from stamp seals to cylinder seals and back to stamp seals again. Rocks are made of minerals. The first lecture on rocks covers igneous rocks. We then cover sedimentary and metamorphic rocks. Stones are basically stuff that has been made of rock. A series on buildings starts with tents and huts. Then we see how humans started to modify the structure of things by using fire. Pyrotechnology including plaster and fired bricks. All of these materials, stone, brick and plaster, plus some other materials, come together to make buildings, the first cities and the first temples. Then we cover pyramids and the development of the arch. Not these particular arches and pyramid, but it is a nice image. Castles and literally the impact of stuff in their development are next, together with churches, synagogues and mosques. 
We then start our journey further into pyrotechnology with ceramics, introducing the fundamentals of the material and its construction. Pottery is one of the most important of archaeological ob objects, so we will go on about it quite a lot. Then we cover glass, and also more pottery, glazed pottery. One of the high points of ceramic production in the Middle East during the medieval period was lusterware, the, the subject of the following lecture. Porcelain, made in China but imported into the Middle East, provided an impetus for a new style of Middle Eastern pottery. Animal materials are next, starting with shells, bones and teeth and how to distinguish between them. The impact of domestication made a major change to how raw materials were procured, and we cover that next. One of the most important materials obtained from animals are their hair and skin. Equids, the horse family, have had a tremendous impact on the archaeology of stuff, and they get their own lecture. Humans are animals too, and in this lecture we will examine attempts at their domestication and also how the combination of stuff and skin led to tattooing. We then start on metals, starting with an overview. Gold, copper and bronze probably each deserve their one lecture, but they get one. Iron and steel are next, with a case study of the development of the sword. Plants are important sources of materials, perhaps especially wood, but also other plants, like reeds. In two case studies, we examine the history of things predominantly made of wood, boats and also the wheel. Textiles are an under-emphasised part of the past, although were as important to the past as they are now. We will start with looking at the materials of textiles and how it is initially turned into fibre. And in the next lecture, we learn how it is turned into fabric. Then we will look at dyes and some types of clothing. Artillery is another interesting case study, incorporating almost all of the materials we have covered so far, starting with the earliest methods of attacking enemies from a distance. The bow has been one of the most important objects in the history of warfare in the Middle East, and we cover this in the next lecture. Finally, we, we move on to later projectile weapons, such as those based on gunpowder. So I hope you'll be able to join me on our journey through the archaeology of stuff, and you'll be looking forward to the next lecture. Thank you.